I'm really excited for this episode. It feels like it could be a state of the union type of message, something that everyone needs to hear. Based on conversations that I have with people about health on a regular basis, I know that people feel doomed to have the same health issues that their parents had, and they don't feel empowered to change their health. Maybe that's you. This episode is with Dr. McNabb, an internal medicine doctor who is now practicing lifestyle medicine. Not only does he help others turn their health around, he turned his own around. You have to hear his inspiring story. Lifestyle medicine puts the health back in healthcare, as Dr. McNabb says. Focusing on lifestyle changes truly has the potential to transform health and promote lifelong wellness. I'll say it again, everyone needs to hear this message. It's the missing link that so many are searching for. If you're a listener and could drop us an awesome review, we'd be so grateful. Then listen for some review shout outs in upcoming episodes. Welcome to the Daily Wellness Podcast. I'm your host, Melissa Meredith. I've led my family on a transformative health journey for over a decade, and now I help other families do the same. This is a place where busy moms can learn about healthy living. I hope that what you learn here helps you feel empowered to take the next step in your family's health journey. Dr. McNabb, <laughs> good morning. Well, thanks for uh, letting me be with you this morning. I'm pretty excited to get to talk with you. Yes. So, Dr. McNabb, the first thing people see on your website is putting the health back in healthcare. What do you mean by that? Sure. So, you know, uh, by and large, healthcare is an oxymoron. You know, uh, when you go to medical school, like I did, when you practice as an internal medicine doctor, like I did for two decades, what you quickly realize is the thing that you're dealing with is disease management. So mm -hmm. we call it health care, but really, you know, doctors and nurse practitioners and providers are managing people with chronic diseases or acute diseases. And, and, and because that's the focus, you know, how do I take care of my diabetes is the focus where the, the focus is not is, hey, how do I not get diabetes in the first place? Well, that is health care, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, for thousands of years, how people had to live their life, they had to be very physically active. They couldn't eat a lot of junk food because guess how much junk food there was for most of mankind's history? <laughs> None. So, so just by the fact of how we had to live our lives, we had to get outside and get sunshine. We had to take the stairs. We had to pick up heavy things. A lot of those things were helping us maintenance our health. And by and large, just how we've slowly changed to this modern way of living those things that kept us healthy, they're not there anymore. So we're not caring for health at all. We're helping people manage diseases. Yeah, totally agree with you. Um, I've called it I've called it sick care for a long time. <laughs> our, our modern way of doing medicine. So I love that that you are advocating for true health. No, absolutely. You know the uh, the biggest driver of chronic diseases. 80% of every chronic disease that you and I could sit down and mention, cancers, heart disease, high blood pressure, cholesterol, diabetes, autoimmune disorders, these things are by and large 80% driven completely by lifestyle. And because we have not done a great job of asking people to change their lifestyle or help them find a way to be able to change to more healthy lifestyles, we're never taking away the drivers of those diseases. And so here's the thing about those chronic diseases. They're chronic because we never actually address the causes that are putting them on us in the first place. So, of course, they don't go away. We've never even tried to address making them go away. We're, we're too busy over here taking care of the symptoms of those diseases. And that's a lot of what standard of care medicine with medicine, pills, surgeries. We're dealing with the symptoms of those diseases. We're never dealing, we're never address the causes. Yep. I agree. Can you kind of talk about that a little bit more? Because I think when you say like 
the causes of chronic disease or, you know, the the way that we're living our life is causing those things. I think a lot of people listening may not be aware of what those things actually are specifically because they're just so common, right? They're everybody else is living the same way. So they don't see how what they are doing is different that might be causing something negative in their health. So can you kind of explain and give some examples? Like what are those lifestyle things that really sure. drive? Well, so uh, to your point, um, I think that a lot of people look around and they say, I feel like my lifestyle looks like everybody else's lifestyle. This My, my family lives this way. Uh, the people that I work with seem to be doing this too. So if everybody's doing it, it must be okay, right? I, I think right. that that's a very common way that people kind of approach their lifestyle. Whatever is common must be good. But here's the truth. Uh, 60% of every adult American has at least one chronic disease, uh, 40% have at least two chronic diseases, and 20% of every adult American that you and I know have at least six chronic diseases. So we are all living the exact same way, and nobody's getting away with it. You know, we're, we're all, we're, we're just drowning under a tsunami of chronic health issues because the lifestyle that somehow we've all kind of slowly adapted to does nothing to help our health. And so when you look at like, well, okay, how does, how would you correct that? What is, what does different look like? You know, it really is the fundamental things of health. You know, our bodies are machines that are built to be in motion continuously. If you're not active, you know, um, you know, if you spend a lot of your day, in a chair in front of a computer screen and then you go from that chair to your car and from that car to your couch and from that couch to your bed, you know, the maintenance that comes with you using your body on a very regular basis, it's not there, you know, and I mean, this doesn't get done, you know, so one out of every two women in this country will develop weak bones. We call that osteoporosis. And why does that happen? Well, when you when you have to push resistance, when you have to pick up heavy things, when you have to, you know, move things and exert force, that is the stimulation that tells your bones, oh, we're using those. They have to stay strong. But mm-hmm. if you're ever doing anything that's exertional at all, your body is not going to take the time to keep those bones strong. And that's how you get 50% of adult women end up with osteoporosis or osteopenia, you know, so it's, it's the fundamental things. Um, nutrition is a big topic for me. You know, you got the, you know, we got my avocados and plants going behind me, but here's the, you know, I tell people all the time, we do not thrive on ultra processed foods. That is not what our GI system was born yeah. to, to deal with. And those things by and large are, turn out to be fairly toxic to our gut microbiome health. Mm-hmm. It's very toxic to our GI. It's very pro-inflammatory. And those things drive chronic disease. And here's the issue. Uh, right now, every American, uh, about 67 to 70% of every calorie consumed by an American is now an ultra-processed calorie. It's none of those things that are behind me on this wall. It's not that avocado or just a salad or how about just pick up a piece of fruit or a carrot yeah. or celery. It's always something that you pulled out of a, a wrapper in a cardboard box that doesn't look anything like the way that it started off, you know, in nature. And because it's so ultra processed, it just doesn't have the same health benefits. Yeah. So, so things like that. You know, and the other fundamental things, um, you know, our social connections and stress relief, you know, mm. we are very, we're born to be social animals. And, and right now we have this real lack of true uh, emotionally nourishing relationships. You know, the, the, the average person does not have more than two close friends. They're lucky if they got that. Whereas you go back a generation or two, you know, you know, I look at my grandmother's generation, you know, her eight siblings got together with all their spouses and all their kids and all their grandkids every weekend 
and they made a communal meal and they played cards and they told stories and fibs and poked on each other and yeah. you know just those big nourishing uh, yeah such a beautiful picture yo know, isn't it oh and I, I can remember growing up as one of those toddlers underneath the table playing cars and playing with the other pack of kids yeah. and watching them just take the time to slow down and enjoy each other's company and show love and yeah. take care of each other. And, you know, I, by and large, you know, we have like one person in our life. If we're lucky, we got our spouse and yeah. that's about it. And you've got some, I call them deal friends. There's real friends and deal friends. You know, the deal friends are the people that you work with, the people that you're in a mutually beneficial relationship with, uh, you know, it kind of gets it done. But, you know, those relationships are very convenient uh, and sometimes they really facilitate, you know, getting work done or that sort of thing, but they're also not deeply and emotionally nourishing either. Right. And I'll tell you, people do not seem to know that uh, being depressed and being lonely is kind of like smoking cigarettes as far as like, will I die of a heart attack? The impact on your health, yeah. Yeah, yeah it's very damaging to be sad and lonely and depressed. Yeah, I'm glad you brought up this factor with like, you know, food <laughs> and um, things like that because there is a lot of research showing like the the strength of your relationships really is plays a big impact on your overall health. And I actually read a book recently that was about radical cancer remission. And that was another common theme between the survivors that they had strong social networks. Yeah. So uh, Harvard has uh, gotten about 78 to 80 years into a 100-year study looking at just this one question, you know, what are the biggest drivers of longevity and health? And over that 80 years of looking at generations of families, uh, what they have found is by and large, the strength of your social connections and your social networks outstrips how much money do you make? Did you go to Harvard? Uh, you know, uh, were you married or not married? You know, any factor that you can point to, and, or maybe it was genetics, maybe good genetics or bad genetics. No, it is the strength of your social networks that seems to be the biggest driver of health. Yeah, that's amazing. What about environmental factors? Have you found that that plays a big impact in your clients' lives as far as environmental toxins or things like that? Oh, sure. You know, um, I tell people uh, these days, uh, because I find it appalling and fascinating, that uh, if you decided today that you wanted to have another baby, and your question to me was, um, I've heard that uh, these toxins like mercury are building up in, in, in fish. How, how long would I have to avoid fish before, you know, my mercury levels would be low enough to, you know, be really safe about making that baby. It's five years. Oh my goodness. You stop eating fish today. You have to wait half up a decade for your body to clear all of that mercury just to make it safe enough to have a standard risk pregnancy. And if your question was, well, how long would it take me to get all of that mercury out of my brain past my blood brain barrier? It's going to take you 22.7 years of not eating fish anymore to get all that mercury out of your brain. So I don't think that that's the exact question that you're asking, but environmental yeah, exposures, point. Yeah. yeah, environmental exposures, you know, how do we produce our food? What toxins are in it? What's in the air? Is air pollution an important driver of pulmonary disease? 100%. You yeah, know, the water, yeah. We're in this relationship with the environment around us, and the healthier it is, the healthier we are too. So, yeah. well, absolutely, those things make a big difference. You know, when I'm talking to patients, what do you do for a living? What are you exposed to? Um, you know, these are really important questions and clues to trying to figure out. Well, why is your body reacting so poorly to, and what is it? But yeah. you know. The things that we experience so it has to be in the environment for you to react to it yeah i love so many women have hormone hormone issues these days you know but <laughs> the first thing i say is like well what are you putting on your body that might be disrupting your hormones you know like what can we look at like 
really easy swaps before you know you go about you know changing your diet and all these other things like what can you buy today to to swap out in your home that would be like a huge benefit to your hormone health oh absolutely you know we uh we frequently use uh patch type medications uh that you know people apply to the outside of their body and those medicines get absorbed right into their body and um, and we know that that absorption works just fine as a mechanism to get medicines into people. Well, think about all the lotions and potions and unguents that people smear on themselves all the time, never really looking at, well, what is this? What are the yeah. things are these things say? What's the long-term effect of doing this for long-term periods of time? I don't know, but you think that you're putting something on the outside of your skin and that's where it stays. Well, that's what's not happening. You absolutely absorb a lot of that stuff right through your skin, and whether it's benign or not, I you know I think it would depend on the product, but I don't think that it's safe to say the lotions and potions that you expose yourself to are never going to do anything more than skin surface effects. Absolutely, yeah. I think you really have a unique perspective on all of this because before having your own clinic doing lifestyle medicine, you were in the hospital doing acute care internal medicine. So can you kind of tell us about your journey? Like what really brought you to where you are today? Yes. So, you know, I think everybody wants to have an origin story, right? You know, how did heck <laughs> get here? And, um, you know, for me, I think for like a lot of people, I think that when standard of care medicine does not lead you to the health that you want, you start to look around. And, mm -hmm. you know, uh, my perspective, I think, is, uh, maybe a little bit more unique in that, you know, I, I was a practicing internal medicine doctor. I still am a practicing internal medicine doctor, but I had about 20 years of being an expert at disease management and pills and, and uh, infusions and what surgeries may be benefit to people and, and looking at how effective was that in maintaining people's health and, or, or more to the point, how ineffective it was. And, you know, I can remember as a hospitalist, I would have patients come to me and they would be on, without exaggeration, 20 or 30 prescriptions, right? Imagine that. that. That's my point. <laughs> no, imagine that. Somewhere between 20 and 30 and 50 and 60 pills a day, because sometimes you need to take it multiple times a day. And, and here's the thing. If those pills are so amazing at keeping people healthy, you would think somebody taking 60 pills a day would be pretty bulletproof. They'd be looking <laughs> for me. And that is not the experience that I found. Uh, people who are on 30 to 60 pills per day, who are their health is, uh, they need a lot of help. And so it was very clear to me that like these medicines, you know, they deal with symptoms. They're symptom management. You know, they will, you have high blood pressure, you take a blood pressure pill, they lower your blood pressure, stop taking that pill, you still have high blood pressure. Well, you're managing a symptom, right? And, and I always like to point out to my medical trainees that, you know, when we talk about palliative care medicine, you know, you know end of life care, palliative care medicine is the branch of medicine where I'm not trying to cure you. I'm just managing your symptoms. And you're like, okay, yep, that sounds like palliative care. Well, Make you comfortable. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, isn't that exactly what happens if I give you a diabetic medicine and lowers your blood sugar, but you're still diabetic? You're just as diabetic as you were before. I'm kind of managing the symptom of blood sugar, but never actually treating the diabetes. Same thing with high blood pressure. Same thing with asthma. Same thing with many chronic diseases. I can lower your cholesterol. The second you stop taking that statin, you're going to have high cholesterol, right? And so, you know, when I got to about 40, um, I discovered that like everybody in my family, I had, was developing heart disease and I was developing diabetes. And I, I, I got a first, you know, first row seat a view of how that looked as a doctor and I, I got a front row view of how that looked as a son mm. of a great dad who just, you know, from the age of 39 had to deal with the consequences of heart disease and seeing cardiologists and side effects of medicines. 
And honestly, I was not interested in that. I was like, yeah. no, I will do anything I can do to have my health and not have to go down that pathway. And that, so that sent me on a journey to look at, well, what are the alternatives? And, you know, it turned out that there was, you know, 80 to 100 years worth of research and literature looking at the health benefits of just making lifestyle changes. Are you eating healthy? Are you managing sleep effectively? Are you managing stress? Are you active enough? Are you just willing to do the foundational things that allows your body to heal itself and be healthy? And it turned out that by doing those things, uh, I didn't have to have heart disease. I've, I've been able to put my heart disease into remission. Uh, I've got lots of scans that show I don't have heart disease anymore. And honestly, insulin, you know, some people need insulin. Let's be clear about that. You know, some people don't make any insulin and insulin can be very life-saving. But, you know, in, in my experience, I made just enough insulin that uh, I, I didn't have that problem but I didn't make enough insulin to support a bad lifestyle. Hmm. And so, you know, when I tried to take more insulin, what I found was if I wanted to go chop wood or go to the gym or exercise, my blood sugar would crash and I felt terrible and I couldn't do the things I wanted to do. I had to go find more calories and go fix my blood sugar. And it very much limited my ability to be as athletic as I wanted to be and do the right. things I wanted to do with my life. And so, you know, I manage it all with lifestyle. And, you know, today my, my A1C is 5.0, which is completely normal. Uh, you know, if we, if we took me over to any doctor's office and let him draw my blood and ask the question, hey, is this, is this guy diabetic? They'll tell you, nope, he's so far from being diabetic that he doesn't need to worry about it. But that's not true. I'm definitely diabetic. I don't make very much insulin, but I know how to eat. I know how to weaponize my activities and exercise to keep my blood sugar so under control that the average doctor would not be able to tell you that I was diabetic. That's amazing. It's, it's just well treated. Yeah. Oh, gosh. I just hope that people maybe even rewind and listen to that all again, because that is, is truly so inspiring, like what you've done and your story, because so many people are not just sick, but like frustrated with their sickness and their illness and their chronic disease, you know, they, they don't want to be where they are and they're doing what their doctor has told them to do. And they still don't feel good, you know, or whether maybe that symptom is gone, but they have a new one because of the pharmaceutical they're taking or whatever. It, it is such a frustrating cycle to be in when you're sick, you know, and you're not actually healing. And so I just absolutely love your story. Um, well, it's very it, it, one thing I always love to point out to people is that, you know, the benefits of lifestyle as medicine is is this. You know, if I give you a pill that lowers your cholesterol, it, it will do one thing for you. It lowers your cholesterol. Great. Does it give you more endurance? Does it help give you a healthier gut microbiome? And then that in turn decreases inflammation in your body and in turn increases neurotransmitters to your brain so you can have good brain health or avoid cardiac disease. You get one thing, one pill equals one thing. It, it, it tells you what it does, high lower cholesterol. When you exercise, when you change your life, not only do you get that benefit too, sure, I lowered my cholesterol. I used to have a cholesterol 250. Now I have a cholesterol that ranges between 100 and 130. But with my lifestyle, I also get to have bigger muscles and I get to go climb Mount Kilimanjaro in October with Elizabeth. Well, I don't Amazing. care. I don't care how many pills you take. It does not make you a better mountain climber or a better spouse or a healthier community member or able to do more things that you want to do. Managing a disease does not give you healthy vitality. The lifestyle does both of those things. Mm -hmm. And what's, what's the point of not having a disease if you still don't feel good and you still can't live the life that you want to and do the things that you want to. Pills will never do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so true. So I just want to clarify. I mean, you were in internal medicine and now you're you're still an internal medicine doctor, I know, but you're you're practicing lifestyle medicine with your patients, right? right? Um, and you had um, 
struggled with heart disease, diabetes, right? And you corrected those things with lifestyle because you saw your your father and many patients <laughs> go down the pharmaceutical route and that is not what you wanted. And you saw that that didn't produce true healing in their lives. And so you went this other way. So is it safe to say for those issues that you faced, like heart disease and diabetes um, and the issues that you help people with, like um, other chronic disease remission and helping them focus on longevity, is it safe to say that the hospital is not really the best place to work on those things if you're truly seeking health? No. You know, so you go to the hospital because it's a safety net. If you're about to die, you know, right. if, you're, you're, if you're in the throes of a heart attack or you can't breathe or you have septic right. shock, the hospital is a safety net that is designed to stop you from dying and stabilize the situation. But after that, they're done. There is no pathway back to good health mm -hmm. from the hospital system. There just isn't. And so, and that's what's missing in, in healthcare in America today is like, okay, we're pretty good at stopping you from dying this very second. But, but then you say, well, okay, so how do I actually get my health back? How do I get to be a 50 or 60 or 70 year old person who can go to Colorado and do trails or play with my grandbabies or run across the airport because I really don't want to miss that light. Yeah. Well, that, that machine doesn't exist. We have not built it yet. And that's, that's really what this practice is all about, trying to add that component in and show people that, you know, not only are these viable options for treatment, but these are probably better options to get your health back and probably the most cost effective way to do that. I always tell people that, you know, for the first 20 years of my life, I was an internal medicine doctor and my, my tools that I treated diseases with were pills and, and infusions and consults with surgeons and that sort of thing. And I'm still an internal medicine doctor. I still take care of chronic diseases. My preferred tools now are lifestyle interventions because when right. people will partner with me and use those things effectively, here's what happens. Not only do they not need those medicines anymore, but they have to come off those medicines. You know, your blood pressure can go too low when you are on those medicines and you don't need them. Those diabetic medicines, you know, when you are controlling your blood sugars without those things, they can make your blood sugars go too low. So one of my favorite things that I do these days is I spend a lot of my time slowly taking people off of their medications. You know, so now they're in this place where they're very empowered. You know, they know what they need to do to have the control of their health the way that they want to. And they can see every time we take off of a prescription, they're like, oh, I was on 10 prescriptions. Now I'm on four prescriptions. I see the progress, right? They love it. Oh, they love it. You know, you know, the side effects of a real healthy lifestyle are you feel a lot better and you live a lot longer. The side effects of some of these medicines are not that nice sometimes. And so in a world where so much around us can make us sick, <laughs> what would be your advice? Yeah. So this is a really simple stuff. Uh, don't eat ultra processed foods, you know. The more simple it is, the more it is, the more original and natural it is, the better off you're going to be. You know, just do that. Eat on on, on ultra filled, uh, ultra processed foods. Next, you know, get active. You know, and, and I, I'm not saying go to the gym and exercise. You know, for hundreds of thousands of years, there was no gyms. People were very active and very healthy. Just be active. You know, being sedentary is a humongous driver of disease process. So whether that's throw your kids in that red wagon and go for a walk or play a little pickleball or, you know, garden, you know, just get out. You can do a lot of activity with a hoe in your hand for sure. Yep. <laughs> a little wood. Be active. Find a hobby that allows you to use your body. It's not about exercise. It's about being active. I always tell people, if you want to be healthy, be active. If you want to be an underwear model, exercise, right? <laughs> but, but those are two different things, healthy and, and, and I don't know, underwear yeah. model gorgeous. Those are two different things, right? 
Um, yeah, I love that because that seems more attainable for everyone. Oh, very you know, so. I, I can find something to do. Yeah. 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 Just do something. And you don't have to get a sweatband and a gym membership and go do weird things that you don't feel comfortable with. You don't need any of those things. Just find a way to be active. Give yourself a little of a challenge. The other things, get outside. Sunlight is good for you within reason. You know, I don't want people out there getting sunburned, but but being out in the world is a good place to find help. You know, sunlight and infrared energy is a very anti-inflammatory experience. And even if you're like out, you know, at the park underneath the shade of the trees, you're still being exposed to infrared uh, radiation, which very much decreases the inflammation in your system. So take that activity outdoors and take your kids with you when you do it. That's going to help you out quite a bit. Um, make sure that you're not one of those 40% of people who are chronically jacking up their sleep. If you're chronically dealing with insomnia, if you're chronically having dysfunctional sleep, that is so important to your health. You know, fix that. It's a fundamental thing. We spend 30 years of our life, if you add it all up, 30 years of our life doing one thing, sleeping. That's a lot of time spent. It must be important. And it is. It's a super important thing to maintain brain health. You know, if, you're, if your goal in life is to avoid dementia, making sure that you're getting good, regular, healthy sleep is a must. Your brain cannot do the maintenance if you don't sleep. So that's so key. And then avoiding toxins. You know, don't unnecessarily put things in your body that are going to damage you. I mean, that seems like a that seems like a no brainer. It is. And then make sure that in this busy, busy world, you are finding some way to safely and healthy deal with your stress, right? Mm -hmm. No, there's no life without stress. That's, yeah. that's not, that's not attainable. We're so busy. We're so stretched thin. we're so stressed to the max and your body is okay with little shorter bursts of stress. Oh, is that a tighter, you know, that sort of thing. Yeah. We can do stress for a minute, but when it's 24-7 with no relief, well, you can really burn up a perfectly healthy human being real quick with that. Because we're not designed for chronic stress. We're designed for a lot of stress for a few seconds or a minute, and then and then we're back to safety again. But we're so stressed now, and I've just seen this everywhere. And, and in fact, I would, I would say that my observation is just that I feel like a lot of the unhealthy things that people do in their lifestyle are really, they have these things in common. They help relieve stress today at the cost of bad health tomorrow. Mm. And so, but it's because we're so stressed out, you know, everybody knows vaping or smoking is probably not the smartest thing, but boy, it sure helps you get through the day. Everybody, yeah. everybody knows that eating a whole bunch of naughty things and desserts and high fat things Probably not a good health thing, but boy, you deserve a treat because you work so hard and you've been under so much stress. I'm sure. Yeah. And then, you know, I should, I know I should. It. Right. Yeah. You rationalize it. You know, every, so a lot of times people have these maladaptive behaviors that they check those two boxes. They, they save your life today at the cost of ruining tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And we really need to be more thoughtful about how can we deal with that stress in a safe, healthy way so that we can invest in health for tomorrow because you know, we're going to need it. There is no 60-year-old who, who doesn't wish they had more help, right? Yeah, true. I think part of that stress relief can also be back to the healthy relationships that we talked about, like having those safe, strong relationships that you can really, you know, be yourself in. And that's a big form of stress relief for me. Oh, absolutely. You know, I, I always find that it's very interesting when I talk to people who kind of start to focus on lifestyle, there's always like an on-ramp. There's one thing they're like, you know, I knew I needed to work on my stress or mental health. And so I started to address that. Or, you know, I, my value system is don't get weak. So I, I so I started to be more active in exercise. And so, so they kind of gravitate towards the thing that seems most important to them. And then once they kind of start to master that and they start to feel a little better, they're like, oh, well, what else can I do? What else can I do to improve my health? Okay, let's go work on that sleep thing. Oh, okay, let's go, let's go figure out what McNabb was talking about, that nutrition thing. Now let's go. Yeah. 
you know, and so it seems like, you know, there's these on ramps into more healthy lifestyles. And I, I think that that, you know, a lot of people think, well, if I'm not going to do all of it, maybe just, I don't know, don't do any of it. Yeah. And every bit of every good decision is a better, is a better spot than you were before that one. Right. And so people shouldn't be intimidated that they need to completely overall all their life in one day, and just completely change, make one good positive thing, add that to your life, master it, and then take the next step when you're ready. It's still taking you in a, in a, in a path towards mm-hmm. better health. I love that advice. And if people want to know more about how they can work with you or continue to learn from you, what would be the best way to do that? Absolutely. They should just totally reach out. So at mcnabwellness.com, uh, uh, they can just reach out uh, on the website. Uh, I, I have people come in and I give them free tours. And I talk about what I do. And if it's right for them, you know, they can meet with me. I work with people as a primary care doctor. There's lots of people out there unsurprisingly, there are many people that want to fix their health, but aren't super crazy about medications. Yeah. And so they're pretty happy to work with a primary care doctor who has that same value system. Uh, there are some people who love their primary care doctor and they really are looking for help with the lifestyle things. How can I, how can I know what's the right thing to do? How much is enough and how much is too much or too little? You know, what's going to be effective if I do it? You know, and so sometimes I'm working with people just as a lifestyle expert and helping them with that. And sometimes people just come to me, uh, you know, uh, for a second opinion on things. But it it, it all happens through that website. If you reach out and you're interested, then we'll sit down and talk and see if it's a if it's a a good fit. And if you feel comfortable with it, then we're happy to help. And if you're like, "Mm, I listened to what you had to say, I don't think (laughs) it would seems right or not the time for me that's okay too you know sometimes when you plant seeds you know they grow over time yeah and is any of your services available virtually or is it all in person so i'll tell you uh i do uh provide virtual services it kind of depends i'm not crazy for it um if that's if that's the only way i can help a person then then by god then we'll make that work um I, you know, for my own selfish health reasons, I love being with people, you know, and I I feel like as a doctor, I need all of my senses. You know, how do you react to what I say? How did you look? You know, how are you breathing? What did you smell like? All of it. I use a, what did it feel like when I poked it? Um, Mm -hmm. the, The more, the more data I'm able to collect, the more I feel like I get a better understanding of what's going on with somebody so and that for me is always going to be best when i when i'm with that person and i want to be with that person and even though today we're together via zoom if i could have if i could have lured you into the office i would have so yeah there are there are patients that i will interact with in other cities or that sort of thing via telemedicine and yeah it kind of depends on what kind of what kind of services they need um, a lot of my advice uh, can be done uh, telemedicine. Uh, a lot of the physical exam and intake things, a little harder to do a VO2 max on somebody via Zoom. So, right. <laughs> so, I kind of need you here. But yeah. So we, we try to accommodate and help people any way that we can. Sometimes it is telemedicine. Yeah, that sounds great. I'll make sure all of your contact info is in the show notes so that people can reach out to you easily. And I just want to thank you for what you're doing. I have done the tour of your office. You're, what you're doing is really needed. We need more people like you in the health and wellness world. And I just really appreciate you. I'm thankful for your time sharing your wisdom with us. Well, I'm very grateful to be able to meet somebody who had similar values and able to kind of help augment that in the community. Because I really feel like the message that needs to get out is, you know, these are important things that, that people should be able to add to their lives and, and can be very beneficial to them and give them back the power of their own health. And if they just have a, the understanding that this is probably more important than you're aware of, and these are some opportunities for you to get that control, I feel like the more we get that message out, the more it becomes part of the expectation for your, 
for our communities and for, for our healthcare providers to provide this, you know? Yeah. All the times when I'm talking with healthcare providers, they say something like, I don't really feel like people will change their lifestyle, so I don't bring it up. So I give them medicine instead. I, mean, I really feel like not giving people that information to understand how powerful these things can be for them really robs them of the choice and the opportunity. And it doesn't need to be this or that. It can be all of the above, right? Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Everybody deserves an informed choice. 100%. And I'll also say, you know, since I saw you last, we have expanded into, we just did a, a ribbon cutting this past week for the Longevity Center. So uh, since you saw me last, I now have a fully functioning uh, internal medicine clinic that seems to be also about a third Gold's Gym and a third yoga studio. Uh, and so uh, we're really trying to be able to help people you know, get the interventions that they need and learn how to do those things in a healthy, safe way too. So it's it's really growing and we're super excited to see, you know, the, how it continues to make progress. Yeah. Well, I think the fact that it's growing kind of proves that doctor wrong that said people won't listen because I think more and more people are realizing the need for a change and the, the need to do something different. And so thank you for what you're doing. Well, oh, we're... You know, it works so well for us. Uh, there's just no way that we could keep it from everybody else, right? It's good for me. I, we have to share it. Thanks for listening to today's episode on the Daily Wellness Podcast. We hope that you found it helpful for your own wellness journey. And if so, we'd love for you to leave a review. Then come back and listen for review shout outs on upcoming episodes. For more information, check out the show notes and connect with us on our website, dailywellnesscommunity.com. 